Hey, Steve Stretsky here, as always, Canadian real estate market update with a particular focus on Vancouver. If you're getting sort of value or entertainment out of these videos, all I ask you to hit thumbs up and subscribe. Questions, comments, put those below. Um, I wanna frame up this week's video, as always, uh, with a short clip this time from the legendary all-time investor, Stan Druckenmiller. Uh, you know, Stan is considered one of the, again, one of the legends in the space, and I, I, I stumbled up across his recent interview here. And, you know, the whole time I was watching this, I was like, wow, I, I, everything this guy is saying makes so much sense. It resonates with everything that, that, that I am have been thinking uh, and how I'm currently viewing markets and monetary policy. And I think he really just summarized it very well um, in this quick, short, two-minute sort of blurb from his longer interview. So I want to clip to that right now. So let's start with, with the Fed and, the, and inequality. I don't think there has been any greater engine of inequality than the Federal Reserve Bank of the United States the last 11 years. So hearing the chairman talk about visiting home shelters, homeless shelters is very, very rich indeed. Um, I just had the best year I've had in 15 years last year. Um, everyone wealthy I know is making a fortune. And why are we making it? because this guy is printing money like there's no tomorrow. And the, the kids in Harlem, in my opinion, are not benefiting from money printing, but Stan Druckenmiller and other wealthy people are. So for the life of me, I can't figure out why the left is so excited about money printing um, when all the data says um, the people that benefit from money printing are rich people that know how to, how to navigate the markets, the odds on bet is we're going to have inflation and inflation is going to hurt poor people again, a lot more than rich people. How does this thing end? To me, the asset bubble, which he's blowing up into unbelievable proportions, busts before the inflation ever really manifests itself. That's what happened with the housing thing in 08, 09. We never really got to the inflation because the asset bubble burst. Um, not dissimilar to what happened in 29. That's not my central case, but let me just say, we've never had a deflationary bust because inflation was too close to zero or 1.5 instead of two. We've had them because we've had these tremendous asset bubbles. It happened here in 29. It happened in Japan in 90. And obviously it happened in the great financial crisis. And there is no one, no group that will get hurt more by a bus than the poor. They will be first in line to get screwed, trust me. So of course what Stan's talking about is this, you know, global central bank balance sheet expansion, this massive QE program that we've been engaged in since the global financial crisis, which we know basically since then asset prices have completely disconnected from fundamentals, uh, continue to accelerate. And we have obviously seen, you know, this, this massive QE program uh, basically, this bazooka coming out at, at the onset of the the pandemic, which stoked the you know the crisis and the decline in asset prices. So central banks were quick to come in and bail them out. I mean, you've got you know the the major central bank balance sheets now sit at roughly thirty trillion dollars. I mean, like so, like my my personal view of this is like again, I think like this is like morally wrong. You can see what's happening. It's like in, in plain sight. Um, like my personal view is that. Like, I, I just wouldn't be surprised just because I have such a, a loss of basically faith uh, in, in sort of that system to change. Like, I just don't think they actually have control of it. Like, I think that that balance sheet, like, it wouldn't surprise me. Maybe it's not my best case, base case, but I wouldn't be, it wouldn't surprise me to see that balance sheet go to $100 trillion. I They're just going to keep throwing everything on it. Uh, it's similar to what Ray Dalio calls, um, you know, he's Ray Dalio points out, that there's basically three versions uh, of monetary policy. Uh, so you've got you know, monetary policy one, right? So that's the original monetary policy that everyone's probably familiar with where, uh, you know, when, you, when economies enter recessions, what, do, what did central banks do? Well, they, they cut interest rates. That's pretty much all they had to do. So, you know, in a normal time, you might cut interest rates from say 6% down to 3%. And that sort of drop in, in interest rates, that drop in debt servicing, uh, and, you know, allowed people to basically refinance, 
uh, and, and borrow more money at a, at a lower interest rate to spur you know, consumer spending to, to get the economy going. So that's monetary policy one. Monetary policy two, on the other hand, um, was, okay, well, you cut interest rates, you, you kind of hit that zero bound, so you, you, know, you can't really re-stimulate the economy through, through these low interest rates because you're cutting from, you know, you're cutting from you know, 1% down to zero. I mean, it doesn't really move the needle a whole lot. So then they come in, uh, monetary policy too, with, with quantitative easing. So you start purchasing you know, uh, government bonds, for example, to lower yields um, uh, across the yield curve and to basically spur uh, you know, higher asset prices, which ultimately create a, a wealth effect, so to speak, that dr then drives consumer spending. So that's monetary policy two. Monetary policy three, on the other hand, is when basically those two essentially almost stop working, right? I mean, how, how much larger can you expand that central bank balance sheet? So basically monetary policy three is when the federal government comes in uh, and they basically do their own version of, of sort of uh, stimulus, right? So they do massive fiscal deficit spending, uh, massive government spending, which is ultimately financed um, by the central bank, right? I mean, the only way that the government can en enact th these, these kind of programs, you have this massive fiscal spending, is to artificially keep interest rates low. Like uh, the amount of issuance of new government debt to, to sort of spur these the, the spending, um, the amount of supply, if you just had like a free market, it would push the rate of interest significantly higher. So central banks have to come in and they have to basically become the number one purchaser of this of this debt. And so that that is monetary policy three, and that's basically where we are at right now. And it comes down to how much further can they continue to do this program before basically you have uh, you know financial markets break, or you have really I think in my view is the societal impact. It's the societal impact of okay, well how high do you want to push the stock market? How high? Do you want to push house prices? Um, you know, how high, how wide can you push inequality? Um, because again, as Stan alluded to, if you continue to push asset prices up higher and higher and higher, and then you've got like a good portion of society that has no assets, you, you create this massive, massive wealth gap. And so I, I think that it, it's quite brilliant and it's interesting to see because you know I had that interview that kind of came out, and then our favorite, our favorite guest uh, was the ECB's Madame Lagarde was out again. Uh, ironically enough, at the same time, uh, so the ECB has kind of been the number one culprit uh, for all of this sort of shenanigans. Um, and they, they for the, for basically the first time in 20 years, the ECB reviewed their uh, you know inflation uh, mandate essentially. And so uh, actually I want to clip to Madame Lagarde's uh, recent update here on the ECB updating their monetary policy and interest rate framework. Take it away. Yesterday the governing council unanimously approved the ECB's new monetary policy strategy. The governing council considers that price stability is best maintained by aiming for a 2% inflation target over the medium term. It replaces the previous double key formulation of below but close to 2%. The new formulation removes any possible ambiguity and resolutely conveys that 2% is not a ceiling. So notice that she says that you know 2% is not a ceiling. So again, basically what that is code for is central banks speak that, listen, we're gonna let the economy run hot. Like if inflation goes to two and a half, like we're not gonna be compelled necessarily to start hiking interest rates just because we're over 2%. And so this is the, the whole thing is that these guys just keep hammering, um, basically doing the same thing for the last, what, 12, 13 years now. Uh, and basically getting the same results, which is if you look at it, so people come out and say, hey, well, you know, QE, QE is inflationary, like, we're, you know, you're printing money. Well, it's like, no, if you actually look at the last 12 years that we've been doing this, if you look at the last 12 years, um, officially anyways, 
um, as measured by this bogus CPI index. And uh, QE is arguably deflationary. Like it hasn't actually spurred inflation. In fact, inflation has been at 2% or even below 2% in, in large parts of the, of the world. So QE, uh, at least as measured by central banks, has not emitted inflation uh, when you look at it, the CPI index, where it has created that inflation, obviously, is in asset prices. But the central banks aren't aren't looking at asset prices in the CPI. So um, that this is you know they're basically doubling down now uh, on on their policy measures. Is that every central bank now is coming out and saying, hey, listen, like we're going to do inflation targeting, averaging. Uh, we're going to let things run hot. We, you know, it's just because inflation today is, you know, running hot at, say, uh, what are we at, 3.5%. Let's just wait. This thing's going to be transitory. We need to wait till everything gets back up. And, and, and like, how long is transitory? Transitory could be, there, there's, no, there's no distinct timeline on transitory. Transitory could be three years. Um, and so, um, you know, ironically, when... Lagarde came out and made that policy statement. Yields, uh, you know, yields in the in the eurozone actually fell that day. So bond yields actually fell, um, despite her basically saying, "Listen, we're going to run this thing hot." Because I think everybody knows that um, central banks are basically becoming the they are the only buyer in town, basically. And and um, you know, all we have to do is look at this exact same week. Uh, junk bonds, junk bonds below investment grade debt, corporate junk bonds, uh, for the first time ever traded with a real negative interest rate. Uh, so they, they, they fell junk, the yield on junk bonds fell below the rate of inflation. Now you can only imagine that if you've got instruments like junk bond, you know, yielding you a real negative return what this does to other asset classes like you basically eliminate any sort of price discovery right so it's like all all of a sudden you know um all, all of a sudden asset like you, you almost can't even price assets right like you if you you eliminate that savings instrument you you eliminate the the um the, the risk, if you eliminate risk, which is what central banks have done, they're telling markets, listen, we're eliminating basically risk. That, so now people feel like compelled or safe that, hey, listen, I, I can buy, you know, a, a real, negative, real negative yield on this junk bond and the central banks will basically just buy it off me at a higher price. Um, and so they've created a scenario where it, it's almost like how do you then put a valuation on a piece of real estate or in the, in the stock market? Like how much higher can these instruments go? So this is, this is sort of the, the ultimate dilemma uh, that is going on. And, and uh, the reason why I say I can see these balance sheets hitting $100 trillion is because the central banks are becoming the only game in town. They're just going to keep adding things to that balance sheet. In my opinion, again, I'm, I'm happy to be wrong. I hope I'm wrong because I think it will be better for society if I'm wrong. I'm just extremely skeptical that uh, these guys are suddenly going to have a come to Jesus moment and reverse, you know, a decade plus of policy making decisions. Um, so anyway, so that's kind of my thoughts this week. A, a couple other things I would really I just briefly want to touch on. Uh, I don't know if anyone noticed, but uh, so, you know, Sydney, Australia for this, uh, Sydney, Australia uh, is going back into lockdown. And, and uh, at the same time, they also re-announced that they are going to be um, re-bringing in, revitalizing the mortgage deferral program in, in Sydney, Australia. So again, hey, we shut down the economy, bring this program back. And that's what I've said on the show before. Um that uh, the mortgage deferral program in Canada in the next crisis, I think, will will almost certainly be back. Um, you know, if it if it worked in one crisis, they'll try it again in the next crisis. Uh, and actually, if we look at the mortgage deferral cliff, which you know we certainly thought was going to be a a, a large development at the onset of the pandemic, the mortgage deferral cliff in Canada has turned into that nothing burger. I mean, as of the end of February, 
um, 98%, 98% of all mortgage deferrals in Canada have expired uh, as of February 28th of this year. So um, it, it's basically been a non-issue. They just added to um, household savings rates here in Canada. And again, you can agree or disagree with these programs, but th th that is the reality. So they deferred about 800000 uh, mortgages in Canada. I think that worked out to about 17, 18% of all outstanding mortgages and 98% uh, of them expired back in February. And, and uh, you know, a month later we hit an all time high in national home prices. So uh, that's where we are this week. Um, I know a lot, a lot of you, uh, you know, follow the channel for, for real estate. I will do a deep dive here on the national uh, real estate data uh, for the month of June, which is going to be coming out next week. So for, for next Saturday's video, we'll, we'll sort of have all the national uh, housing data. So we'll do a deep dive analysis on that. Uh, but as always, we'll see you next week. Cheers.